Hello, I'm Matt Silverman. SEPTA has been working diligently to make riders feel safe while aboard mass transit during this public health crisis. A mere few months ago, ridership was down 90%. Now people are cautiously venturing out and using SEPTA services more frequently, but it's nowhere near where it was a year ago this time. To plan for what's next, SEPTA introduced a recovery plan as they continue to navigate through this unprecedented pandemic. Joining me now to discuss further is Leslie Richards, the general manager of SEPTA. Leslie, thanks for your time. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So I want to get your thoughts on a lot of issues, but let's look back from March to now and how SEPTA was almost put at a standstill. So how did you get schedules running pretty close to normal in a mere couple of months? What did it take? Well, look, uh, there were times that uh, we severely reduced the schedule to a truly lifeline schedule. Um, we had to do that due to ridership, but also due to the number of healthy and available employees we had. And that changed every single day. Uh, we slowly built the system back up. We know that uh, in addition to mass compliance, that the ability to social distance on our system is extremely important and extremely important to get people back on the system and to feel safe on our system. So we wanted to get um, all of our vehicles back in service um, so that uh, for the majority of the day, if not the entire day, uh, those who are riding our system are able to do so uh, with six feet uh, between them and uh, the next rider and as well as our employees. And so we brought the system back up. We now have all of our vehicles, um, nearly 3,000 vehicles in service right now. And uh, so all of our um, routes, uh, besides uh, just a few suspensions due to uh, working work issues, not pandemic issues. And uh, we wanna make sure that, uh, that our entire system is available uh, for those who need it. And uh, we are seeing, as we did through a survey, uh, of our riders that those who are on our system uh, do feel safe and uh, feel that uh, they can uh, use the system as needed um, during this unprecedented time. Yeah, so last time we talked, we, talked, we discussed um, what was then the new social distancing coaching program. For those who are unfamiliar, employees are handing out masks to riders at stations. So has that initiative expanded to more stations and what's been the reaction from riders? It has. It's been very well received. In fact, I've been asked to talk about it on national um, in national conversations. It's very unique that SEPTA, well, any transit agency would have this group of volunteer employees uh, who are traveling our system, reminding uh, people of uh, social distancing protocols and uh, making sure that anybody who is either not wearing a face covering properly or not wearing one at all, uh, is then also handed, uh, handed a mask to wear. And uh, so this has been um, extremely helpful. We know that uh, the way to increase um, mask compliance on our system is to positively um, educate and, and discuss uh, why it is important. Um, and so our social distancing coaches are a big part of that. Uh, very proud to say that uh, at my last update, we are in the high 80 percentage, uh, you know, around 88, 89 percent of, uh, of mass compliance, uh, which is very good. Uh, of course, we want to get to 100 percent and we will continue to do everything we can uh, to get there. So uh, in terms of just the amount of passengers on the vehicles in your recovery plan, was announced that SEPTA will be installing passenger counters for all of the vehicles. So A, what will this do for customers? And B, what's the timeline on when um, that will be implemented? Right. Well, this is very important because of course we wanna run the best system we can right now. And so the way you can run your best system is if you have accurate, um, updated um, information. So those counters will allow us to have real time uh, counts on our system. So we'll know which routes are being utilized, which um, vehicles are more crowded than others. Eventually we'll have the capability to show the public through our app and through other um, uh, communication uh, methods. Uh, for instance, 
which vehicles, what time of day are most crowded. So if they want to space out their um, trips, if they want to make sure they, um, you know, uh, can have more space between them and the next customer, uh, they can make those decisions. Uh, when I was at PennDOT, we had a very successful program where we took historic data and we showed how um, the travel times, where the congestion, where the accidents were, for instance, over a Thanksgiving holiday. And so then uh, we released that to the public and it allowed uh, those people who were traveling uh, to visit family and friends on the holiday to space out their trip if they wanted to, so that they would have you know, less travel time, they would have a less chance of getting into an accident. It's just good to see that. And that's how I see this data being utilized in the future. Just showing people if they want to plan their trips, um, what they can expect and uh, what they expect to see on the system. So it's going to be extremely useful. Yeah. So I, I want to also ask about some budget concerns. Um, last month, you testified before the Pennsylvania House Trans Transportation Committee. You told lawmakers that if you, meaning, you know, the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority, didn't receive funding from Harrisburg, SEPTA really just won't be the same. Um, could you tell me about, you know, how much money that, you know, you're losing from the pandemic? Sure, sure. Well, uh, just to give you some, um, uh, you know, some reference here, uh, we get nearly 40% of our operating budget through the fare box, uh, as people buying, um, you know, uh, fares uh, to get onto our system. As you've mentioned, we're down to around 35% of ridership as we were pre-pandemic. So right there, um, that is troubling. There were months uh, over the summer where we would typically take in $40 million a month um, through fares and we were barely getting 4 million. And so that is only um, you know, adding up and, uh, and, and so we fall further and further behind. Uh, then we have uh, other, um, you know, challenges in that uh, the majority of our funding comes from the state and they have also, uh, they're, they're feeling it as well and they're billions of dollars uh, in debt. And then we also have the Turnpike issue uh, where they issued debt and part of what uh, the current legislation, Act 44, requires uh, the Turnpike to go out for debt. And then in return, the money that they raise goes to PennDOT and it gets passed through to transit agencies. They are unable to do that right now because their um, volume of traffic is down considerably and, uh, and they have to watch you know, their debt, their debt uh, um, ratios as well. And so uh, that leaves us with our local funders, which are Philadelphia and the four surrounding counties of Bucks, Montgomery, Delaware, and Chester. Uh, there again, uh, they've all been hit very hard and they have their own budget issues uh, to worry about. And so uh, we are very worried for the first time ever in SEPTA's history. We are facing an operating um, uh, budget as well as a capital budget shortfall. It's never happened before this way. And so um, we are, we're, in a tough, we're in a tough spot. Um, the legislation uh, that I mentioned uh, that allows the money to flow from the Turnpike to PennDOT uh, to, to transit agencies, that uh, was set uh, to sunset next year. And so without a change, we're not sure where that money is going to come from. More needs to be done is basically what the recovery plan is in the future. So just in your opinion, what's the biggest thing that you foresee changing about um, the Transportation Authority? I, I truly think that um, the way we're funded has to change. I think uh, it's been very evident uh, that we are an emergency service, that if we had not functioned during the pandemic and we function every single day of the pandemic, um, essential workers could not have gotten to their jobs, which means people would not have gotten the service that they needed at healthcare institutions, people who clean the rooms, people who feed those who work at the institutions um, would not have gotten to work, in addition to others, right? We know that those who worked in our grocery stores would not have gotten to work. We know that a lot of the minimum wage paying and close to minimum wage paying jobs would not have gotten to work. Um, previous studies have shown that a third of Philadelphians do not have cars, and so the only way they do get around uh, is, is, is on SEPTA. 
And so we have to take a look at how do we fund law enforcement? How do we fund ambulance service? How do we fund our fire um, emergency services? Uh, because we cannot live without them. And I firmly believe we cannot live without public transit in a region like Philadelphia. And so we have to figure out what is um, the way uh, that we can fund uh, this lifeline service um, that is needed for us all to function, um, not just at times of emergency like the one we're in now, but, uh, but into the future. And so things have to change because uh, where we are right now is just not sustainable. Are you, are you concerned that this pandemic will threaten the longevity of public transportation in the long run? Because more people are working from home now. Center City accounts for many of the jobs. I mean, that, that, those regional rail stations, Jefferson, Suburban Station, uh, Suburban in particular connects all these office buildings. And a lot of the workforce is working from home. So if that continues, ridership will still be in a decline. Mm -hmm. Look, uh, pre-pandemic, all transit agencies measured themselves by ridership. Even the size of the agencies measured themselves by ridership. And now that's changing. Now it is, who is it that you are carrying, right? What employees uh, and employers, you know, are you sustaining? Um, what happens if those employers cannot get the employee workforce uh, that they need out to them? You know, what happens to our economy? We're seeing um, the huge economic impact of this pandemic. And uh, I think it's important to note that there is not a transit agency in the entire country that stopped because of the pandemic. Every single transit agency needed to continue to function. Um, and that includes, you know, our services to the elderly, that includes um, those with disabilities, that includes uh, emergency medical uh, transportation as well. Um, you know, if you need dialysis, you need it, whether or not there's a pandemic going on. And so um, we really do uh, need to provide um, those services. And so um, that'll be part of the discussion moving forward. Uh, everyone always can agree on the need and the importance, uh, but it's tough to get people to agree on how to pay for it. Right. Is there anything else you'd like to add about, you know, just the recovery plan in general that I didn't touch on? Just because we're in crisis mode and just because we're responding to emergencies, uh, well, it feels like on a daily, constant basis, doesn't mean that we shouldn't be thinking uh, of innovative ways uh, to help our customers, to help our employees, to help uh, the community. And so one of the things uh, included in the recovery plan is we're now allowing uh, our regional rail riders to bring their bicycles uh, onto regional rail. It's a big difference. I've actually seen a few um, bicycles on uh, regional rail while I've been on them in the last few weeks. People are taking advantage of it. And that might be something we want to look at is how do we continue that? How do we promote uh, people using different forms of active transportation to access uh, transit? I did read that bikes are going to be allowed on. Uh, can you give me the rationale behind that? Because if space is such a hot commodity on regional rail, why, why yes to bikes? Right. So look, we have to look at our current circumstances. And while in general, uh, our system's at 35% uh, ridership. The ridership on regional rail is much lower. Uh, and that's for a variety of reasons. Uh, those who typically take regional rail may have other options, such as cars uh, or carpooling or the ability to work from home uh, to telecommute. And so we're not seeing the same increases on the regional rail that we're seeing uh, across our transit lines. So there is more room on the regional rail lines. And we, again, want to make our system as available and accessible as possible. And, uh, you know, the idea came to us. Uh, someone brought it. It was not my idea. Someone brought it to us. Of course, we considered it and said, let's try it. And it has been very well received and it's, and it's being um, utilized quite a bit. All right, Leslie Richards, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much.